Hello everyone. Uh, in today's session, we're going to talk about remote procedure calls, abbreviated as RPC. This type of function calls a direct extension of local procedure calls in operating systems. And the main motivation behind RPC is to maintain the access transparency in distributed systems. As you may remember, message-oriented communications we explicitly exchange the information based on send and receive commands, which didn't, you know, conceal the communication. Um, so we needed a different type of communication paradigm in which processes can call procedures at remote locations and no message passing would be visible to the user. Although the idea is simple, um, some subtle problems exist um, and such as different machines operate together with different address spaces. Um, also processes need or need not to block each other depending on the RPC implementation. Finally, considering you know machines being different platforms, that might also be a problem problematic uh, one so let's discuss these issues one by one before uh, but before before all that we you know let us start with uh, why do we need you know RPC all right so here goes the outline of today's session we start with motivations for needing another communication paradigm RPC or remote procedure calls we talk about local and remote procedure calls and explain how RPC works we mention about challenges and widely adapted strategies to address these challenges one of those solutions is called interface definition languages we'll touch upon that and RPCs are in original form are synchronous though we will also mention that there are asynchronous versions and implementations as well. Finally, we'll touch upon one of the RPC implementation frameworks, RPYC, so-called remote Python call. As we mentioned, operating system level communication and going through the OCI model reveals that message passing communication typically implemented at the OS level as sockets and socket IPIs you know, are used to provide access to the network and this cannot conceal the underlying remote send and receive processes. In other words, although sockets require reads and writes to make distributed computing or distributed communication look like a local one, the IO workloads cannot be concealed. We truly need a functional interface to ease our programming experience and this is where the RPCs jump in. Okay so let us start with conventional local procedure calls. I'm given uh, two different examples using Python and C programming languages to be able to make the call the caller you know in a local procedure call to be able to make the call the caller must first push the parameters of the function onto the stack in some order uh, for instance in C the the last one becomes first in the stack um, after the local procedure call such as read uh, the return value is placed in a register and the control is transferred back to the caller Finally, the caller removes the parameters from the stack. Similarly, in the Python example as shown in this slide, process pushes values 0, 1 up until 9 to the stack and generate a call for the function f uh, 10 times. Also, it adjusts, adjusts the stack for the compilation of function f, you know, but only once. In C, parameters can be called by value or by reference. If it is value, the call procedure can modify it, and yet that will not change it, change the value of that variable in the caller. Um, a reference variable, on the other hand, is just an address, and that's what it's what it is pushed to the stack. Um, once it is changed, it also changes the memory value, and hence the variable itself. Um, so remit procedure calls is an extension to that idea of local procedure call for constructing distributed based applications. Using RPC, the programmers avoid the details of the interface of the network. For example, supposing a process uh, on a machine A calls a procedure on machine B, the calling process A is suspended and the execution of the called process takes place on machine B. All the necessary information can be transported from the caller to the callee in the parameters and can come back in the procedure result. No message passing is visible to the programmer. RPC is ideal for client and server 
point-to-point -point applications. The transport independence of RPC isolates the application from the physical and logical elements of the data communication mechanisms. There are also some challenges, of course. Uh, it's not that easy. Uh, like uh, procedures run on different machines and their address spaces are different. This may lead to complications, particularly if you want to pass by reference. Parameters and results have to be passed between machines, which is particularly hard if machines are not identical. Finally, we want to note that failures uh, or failure patterns might be quite different in different machines and operating systems. RPC implementations must handle all of these challenges very, very carefully. So how does it work? What is the underlying process details that makes RPC as much as transparently work in real implementations? Well, it is quite analogous to how local procedure calls work, in which operating system makes system calls for I.O. But instead of calling operating system local system calls, the RPC packs the messages, that's called message marshalling by the way, along with the call and send the request to the server. Instead of system calls, client uses something called client step which calls receive and it blocks until the reply comes back so suppose that client is running two programs program 1 and program 2 and program 1 makes an RPC the program 1 is going to be blocked until the reply comes back as shown in this picture when the message is received by the server operating system it is passed to the server step which transforms the incoming network remote requests into local ones server stab, stab is on receive mode and blocks typically until a connection is made the server stab unpacks the parameters and runs a local procedure call after the process is finished, server step does the same kind of packing of the client step and send the message back to the client step and finally client step gets the result and returns it to the caller. The caller, by the way, has no idea about that work uh, which is being done remotely instead of by the local operating system. Perhaps maybe some delay due to the, due to the network, uh, but otherwise it is totally transparent. In the RPC, send and receive calls are, or are also hidden away, just like system calls are hidden away in traditional static and dynamic libraries. By the way, as you can see, program 2 does, does not have any RPC call, so it's not affected by the program 1's RPC. It's just another thread working in parallel. All right, here is the summary of the example I've just provided in the previous slide. This summary simply orders all the detailed operations that client and server stabs as well as the operating system must do to make the RPC transparent and work. Um, and, um, you know, of course, the way that it, that it works uh, explained here uh, seems quite easy, but there are also a lot of challenges. You know, although it seems quite subtle and easy, uh, RPC have their own challenges due to mostly heterogeneity of the underlying computers of the distributed system. This includes character coding, little and big endingness, word size that may differ from one, from one machine to another. Therefore, when the parameters or any data structure passed over to a server, data corruption may occur, and we must probably will end. Uh, we will, they, we will end up having wrong result in that case. Another issue is passing the pointers. In other words, when we make calls by re reference, pointers are meaningful within the address space of the local processes, and we cannot simply pass the local address to the server and, and expect it to work. Even if the server has the exact same data in its memory, the address will not be the same. And one solution is to not allow any pointers, of course. But yet most implementations use pointers, particularly if you use C programming language. So another solution is copy and restore operation. So in this solution, we copy the data with the send message and create a copy in the server. After modifications by the server, restore the data in the client by resending the data back which is going to be the modified version of the original data unfortunately of course this leads to double copy of the data being worked on and double copy can be reduced to one depending on the calls nature for example a remote read request will only make the server send a, a copy of the data a remote write operation will only send the data from client to server you know just once and get possibly an, an, a message uh, with, an, with an acknowledgement. 
Let us explore, for instance, the message format. Suppose a character takes up one byte of memory and a floating number takes up four bytes. As you can see, a 32-bit long register will hold one byte of character value in the LSP bit, uh, you know, positions. Uh, but depending on the endianness and the interpretation of these bits will be different. Um, by different and heterogeneous operating systems or heterogeneous hardware uh, that will corrupt the data. Also the way we present the data structures is important for instance negative numbers may be presented in one, two's complement uh, or one's complement form. That must be also handshaken. Characters can be represented in 16-bit Unicode. Uh, we can enlarge the number of examples here as you can see uh, but the main idea here is to, to we want to remove all the unambiguity so that we can deal with these types of challenges and remote machines must know all these details to implement RPC accurately so next thing we do is to make sure that the caller and the callee agree on the transport mechanism one can choose for instance TCP IP you know based on connection oriented or data data ground based connectionless mechanism once the pro pr protocol is defined server client steps they do not you know very much they don't vary or they change except the interfaces of different procedures so by the way an interface consists of a collection of procedures that can be called by a client which are implemented in the server However, writing client and server steps or different interfaces might be pain in the neck. So a need arises here to automatically generate client and server steps. Interfaces are specified by means of interface definition languages, IDL. So the interface defined in IDL can be compiled into a client and the server step and these programs would be generated automatically. IDL compilers are used to generate these steps. Speaking of IDL compilers, so let us see a typical build scenario. As can be seen, IDL compiler shown in this picture would be an interface definition language and generate those steps. But it also generates headers to be included by the manually written client and server codes. Finally, uh, after having server codes, client stops and header ready, we run a C compiler or in, this could be a Fortran compiler as well to generate the four object files client, client stab, server and server stab object files with the runtime library calls the linker finally generates the binaries for the client and server code that will allow us to make remote procedure calls you know as I mentioned before RPCs in their original implementation are synchronous uh, for example we provided a protocol earlier in which a program was blocked when it made a primitive procedure call remember program 1 and program program A and program B or program 1 and program 2 however clients do not need to block when we transfer money uh, between different accounts for instance or we want to add entries to a database especially we do not block when we start remote services uh, or you know start a batch processing uh, you know remember that uh, batch processing is an execution of a series of non-interactive jobs you know all at one time so apparently uh, it does not require a much of an interactive touch uh, so apparently we do not need to block it so when the client RPC does not block it continues the caller process immediately unlike us unlike the synchronous RPC in which server need to acknowledge these two RPC calls are illustrated you know down below finally for the asynchronous RPC um, after service is done you know with the with the call it shall send the result if any and send an acknowledgement in that case the RPC uh, type this type of RPC is referred as deferred synchronous RPC finally I wanna mention uh, about a useful framework called RPYC as I said these are uh, Python remote, remote calls and it's a transparent uh, Python library for symmetrical remote procedure calls clustering distributed computing some of the features of this library is that it is uh, transparent um, so it allows access to remote objects as if they were local uh, existing code works seemingly with both local and remote objects um, it is symmetric the protocol itself is completely symmetric meaning both client and service can serve requests so this allows among other things for the server to invoke callbacks on the client side um, it also supports both synchronous and asynchronous operation 
Um, this implementation also is uh, platform agnostic, so it could be 32, 64-bit, a little big in DNS, uh, Linux, Linux, uh, or Windows, Solaris, Mac. It all works on all these plat on these on these platforms uh, and access objects across different architectures. So it employs a capability-based security model. Also, it also integrates nicely with TLS, SSL, SSH, and super servers like INET. So I would encourage you to explore, you know, the INET and XINET integration process. Uh, with this, uh, you know, RPC framework, um, and finally, uh, with version 3.0, 3.0, the model is now service oriented. This means server is no longer full slave, but rather part of the full RPC platform environment. This will improve the security aspects of the library dramatically. All right. So, in summary, today we talked about local and remote, remote procedure calls by providing set of motivations for why we need them. Then we have given the implementation details of RPC, covering the interface definition, definition languages, challenges of implementation, and types of RPC. Finally, we touched upon one of the frameworks that allows us to use RPC easily in our large-scale distributed system design and implementations. If you have any questions, please feel free to share it through my email down below, and I'll be glad to answer your questions. See you next time.